tonight is Starlight Time and the New Physics, which is the um, title of my book that unfortunately I could not um, get any copies to bring along here tonight. But I am a uh, creationist, I have a biblical worldview, I believe that God created this whole universe in six ordinary days about uh, six odd thousand years ago, um, as described in the uh, Genesis chapter 1. Um, I also believe that God has given us a mind, an intelligence, and an inquisitive nature, and a desire to understand nature and how the universe operates. And it would be remiss if we didn't do that. We have, um, you know, we, it's the very basis of our modern technological revolution and the advancement of science in the past several hundred years is this notion that God has made uh, the laws of physics, the laws of nature, in such a way that they're stationary, that we can investigate nature. And um, I believe that um, the structure of the universe is part of God's creation. It's up to us to try to explore and see if we can understand um, how he did that. But this universe is preserved by him. In other words, the laws of physics that we investigate are part of that creation and part of his sustaining power. Now in this talk, I must warn you that there is physics. I hope that doesn't scare you off. That I've got a number of animations and I hope that we can have a little bit of fun here. We are told today in our modern, uh, this modern sort of culture that the universe is dominated by dark energy and dark matter. In fact, it makes up 96% of the stuff of the universe. The Big Bang model, the standard model, uh, requires uh, this unknown stuff uh, in order to make the theory fit the observations. And without that, the theory would, be, um, would fail. So th these unknowns have been invented. But if I could show you another theory that uh, fits the same data, but does not require this unknown stuff of dark energy and dark matter, um, that would discredit the Big Bang. Because you see, cosmology is, it's not exactly science. I, I discussed this last time. Cosmology is not science in the sense of a repeatable laboratory experiment. It's closer to a philosophy. And we are limited in just um, observations that we can take from the cosmos. So um, there are multiple possible explanations for the same data. But if you can uh, explain one set of data in a more parsimonious way, with less assumptions and less inventions of less unknowns, then that would be good, wouldn't it? So let's have a look at this stuff. How do you measure the mass of the sun? I have to give you a little bit of basic physics here. From Newton's laws, you can see you can derive an equation where the mass of an object is determined by a test particle circling that object. So if you measure the speed of the test particle around the object and the distance from the object, so like a planet around the sun, then you can measure the mass of the, of the sun by the, the motion of the test particle. So we have the mass of the sun, we know of, is about 99.9 something percent of the mass of the solar system. It's nearly all of the matter in, in our solar system. And we see planets moving around the sun. And as you move out, you'll notice they actually move slower, which is all, also part of uh, Newton's laws of physics and the motions in our solar systems. As we move out further and further, you'll see more planets and they're moving slower and slower. But if you take any one of them as a test particle, use that equation, you can get the enclosed mass inside the orbit of that, of that planet. So you can progressively move out and you can add on the mass of each planet, which is the test particle, as you move out further and further. And that's what we would call calculating the mass dynamically. You're not weighing it any other way, you're using the laws of physics to do a dynamical calculation. And so that's what we mean by the dynamical mass. Now, in the early um, 1900s, really the, the late 1800s, around the turn of the century, uh, there was a problem with the orbit of Mercury. When it circled around the Sun, now this has been exaggerated here in this illustration, 
the orbit doesn't exactly retrace upon itself, and it forms something like a rosetta. That means the, the uh, what we call the perihelion, the advances slowly over time. And astronomers are able to measure this very, very precisely. And they worked out that the uh, orbits of the other planets should influence the, the, the orbit of, of Mercury. But there was a leftover amount of 43 arc seconds per century that couldn't be accounted for by normal uh, physics of the day. Arc second is very small. You know, there's a degrees, 360 degrees divide one degree into 60 minutes, one minute into 60 seconds. Well, they had worked out 43 arc seconds per century was, was in error, was an anomaly. And so they proposed at the time, this is going back over 100 years ago, that there must be something perturbing the orbit of Mercury that they can't see. And so they called it dark matter, something you can't see. Maybe it was an asteroid belt that was invisible and it couldn't be detected, but it was between the Sun and, and Mercury, and that was perturbing its orbit, see? So this is the idea of dark matter. Others suggested that there was the planet Vulcan <laughs> that was hidden in behind the Sun, and, and as the Earth orbited, Vulcan orbited perfectly in synchronization so that you could never see the planet hiding in there behind the Sun, but that planet was enough to perturb the orbit of Mercury, hence it's called dark matter, you see? can't be seen. But of course, um, th as the story goes, the solution, the solution was found when Einstein came up with his, uh, um, with his uh, theory of relativity, his general theory, and he published in 1917 that using uh, his uh, new physics, he actually calculated quite precisely the 43 hour seconds. So the, the uh, solution to the problem wasn't that you needed dark matter, you needed new physics to solve the problem. And by, by Einstein introducing that new physics, he solved that problem. Now, if we look at, for example, um, what are called rotation curves in spiral galaxies. Now, this is a galaxy shown side on. And if you can imagine, that galaxy is rotating. So on one side of the galaxy, the stars and gases are moving away, and on the other side, they're moving towards you. Well, these, these uh, uh, gases out in the disk regions of spiral galaxies are measured by putting a spectrograph on it. I'm looking at the light coming from this part of the region of, of the disk, and you can see that the, the, the galaxy is, is rotating by looking at the uh, Doppler effect. This is something I'll discuss in a minute that they can see this happening. And so they measure the velocity of the stars in this region, and out here there's no stars at all. So they see the speeds of the gases that are orbiting out there in the disk where you can see no stars. This is right out beyond the sort of edge of the visible disk of a galaxy. But applying the same equation as I showed you before, they didn't calculate the enclosed mass, the dynamical mass of the galaxy. And guess what happens when you do that? You get too much matter. You get much, much more matter than what you can see with light. And so this is a problem that has been around for quite some time, and dark matter has been proposed. Because you see, um, even in Newtonian physics, that as you go further and further out from the center of the, of the, the central bulge of the galaxy, the speeds of the stars and the gases should get slower and slower, but they don't. Out here in these typical uh, um, spiral galaxies, hundreds of thousands of these have been measured like this, and they don't get slower and slower. In fact, they tend to be sort of like constant, constant speed. So dark matter, halo dark matter, like a spherical halo around the whole galaxy has been proposed as the solution to this problem. And this stuff you can't see, therefore, dark matter again, right? Well, this problem goes on. It's, it's not just limited to spiral galaxies. You find it like in these large clusters to the point that like 90 or more than 90% of the actual cluster is dark matter because they see the motion of the different galaxies within the cluster and you can do the same type of calculation. It's a little bit more complicated 
but then you get an inferred matter or mass of the cluster that seems to be like much, much more than the actual visible matter in the cluster. And so if we look at a table of this stuff, and here we call this the mass to light ratio, what that means is the matter, the amount of mass calculated from the dynamics compared to the amount of mass you can see. And so you see the ratios, if you look at spiral galaxies, the rotation curves, you see something like two to five times the amount of mass is measured as compared to the matter you can see. Yes, you understand what that, that means? And if you move out to larger and larger systems, like you've got the Milky Way galaxy with dwarf satellites around it, small galaxies rotating around our galaxy, and you see you're out here in a um, radius of 600,000 light years. Um, galaxies are radiuses of only like 30,000 light years. You go out further and further, you go out to small groups of galaxies or large clusters of galaxies, look, you see that the mass to light ratio becomes here like order of 100, here it becomes 400 to 600 times, which means that of the large clusters, that means 99.99% of it must be dark matter, stuff you can't see. Wow. Doesn't that start to sound a bit ridiculous? Yeah. Nearly the entire cluster is made up of stuff you can't see. So this is a big problem on all scales it has been observed in the universe. Some years ago, I met this guy back in about 2004 actually, and he came out to, this is a photograph in, uh, in uh, Fremantle in Western Australia, we went down there fish and chips there at Cicerello's, if anyone's been there, get a good fish and chips at that place. He had um, published a paper, uh, this was about 1999, and the title of the paper read, Derivation of Tully Fisher Law, Doubts About the Necessity and Existence of Halo Dark Matter. That's that idea of the halo, spherical halo of dark matter around spiral galaxies. So he had a, a new theory where his theory seemed to eliminate the need for dark matter in, in galaxies. And that's what piqued my interest. His, his new cosmology was called, uh, his new theory was called cosmological special relativity. He modeled it off Einstein's uh, special relativity theory but he sort of applied it to the whole universe. And as a physicist, when you read cosmological and special relativity, those words really don't go together. That's why I bought the book and read it. I thought, oh, this might be crazy, but it might be worth reading. His uh, idea is to introduce a new dimension in when you look at the structure of the universe. Now, we know we have three space dimensions. We have one time dimension. He introduced a new dimension he called velocity dimension which he called it as the velocity of the expansion of the universe. Um, we see galaxies all around us in every direction we look in the sky, and we see actually, uh, not velocity, but we see redshift in the light coming from those galaxies, which of course, starting back um, some uh, 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 90, 80, 90 years ago, um, uh, from Hubble, that idea was that the universe is expanding because of those observations. Well, Carmelli's idea, his idea is a Big Bang cosmology, don't get me wrong. His idea was to start in a singularity and over time the universe expands. Now, I've taken this from Wikipedia and this is a description of the standard Big Bang model, which I've tried to adapt, but it's very hard to draw another dimension into a universe. So, if you can imagine at any epoch in the universe, its expansion rate is at a different velocity, and that's what Carmelli meant. So he created something like space velocity rather than space time, where, where the velocity of the expansion of the universe is uh, different at, at different epochs in, 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 in the past. And, um, of course, this notion that the universe started at some past moment in time is, is very popular even amongst evangelicals. Um, William Lane, Cra Lane Craig uses that actually as an apologetic, you know, that the universe began in time, finite in time, go back into the past, creation event sort of thing, right? I personally don't believe that because um, Big Bang cosmology is based on no creator, it's an a causal universe. 
where they're looking for some sort of cause without a creator. But um, many anti-Big Bang cosmologists, they don't like the Big Bang sim simply because of this beginning in time. In fact, um, uh, back in the 50s when the steady state people were sort of vying against the, 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 um, the Big Bang cosmologists, the steady state is called the Big Bang, is, uh, they called them the, the American ev evangelicals, even though that they were atheists because of this idea of an origin of time. So Carmelli's model is similar in that sense, but I want to try and give you some idea. So I've got this graphic. This is the usual sort of representation of general relativity. So you see the particle moving in space-time, the idea is. Space is curved by the central mass. <coughs> the curvature tells the particle how to move. This is the usual geometric representation in general relativity. But um, what Carmelli did, he added this new dimension into Einstein's field equation, so it becomes a five-dimensional field equation. And you know, you're not required to um, remember this, but you can take notes if you like. Um, in the normal uh, physics, we have this as a, the normal Newtonian equation, the motion um, in the... Uh, uh, let's say it could be in a solar system or this is really more applied to very large scale structures like, like galaxies and, and clusters and so on. But what Carmelli did when he solved it using this extra dimension he got a new equation that contains new physics. So you see where this is going you know, because back way back over 100 years ago what they wanted needed was new physics and they could explain the motions in the solar system without dark matter. Well, my thoughts were, well, maybe if I follow this through, maybe Carmelli's ideas can give us new physics that can explain the universe without dark matter and dark energy. So that was what interests me at the time. Now, galaxies as a whole, when we look at them, sort of rotate um, as a whole. They're not solid objects, but um, they, they seem to have, as because of this rotation curve problem, the speeds of the gases at the limbs of the spot of the galaxy <coughs> seem to um, essentially be constant. And so that means that they generally have a sort of a constant <coughs> rotation speed. And this uh, relationship has been discovered, or had been discovered many years ago, called the Tully Fisher relation. And that's what was in the title of that paper that Carmelli had published. And the, that, that rotation speed is related to the mass of the galaxy. And of course, the mass of the galaxy is related to its luminosity. And people actually use this Tully Fisher law to measure distances to galaxies because it's related to their luminosity. And lumen, using luminosity, you can calculate distance. So, um, the idea that I, just to try and give you some sort of feeling for this, is that. Um, in the usual, uh, usual um, understanding of physics, let's call it the Newtonian understanding of physics for galaxies and so on, even in an expanding universe, the idea is that the particles in a galaxy are constrained by the gravity of the galaxy. The effect of the expansion of the universe, uh, well, it has no effect on, on the galaxy itself. This is the idea. Carmelli's idea by adding this extra dimension was that the material fluid of the universe, which is some sort of a approximate average matter density, if you like, that sort of fluid um, does affect the, the particles in galaxies. And the rotating galaxies, you see that effect of there's a rotation effect in the, in the disk of the plane of the galaxy around the azimuth, something like that. So, um, that, that's about the best way for me to explain this. And so I've got a couple of animations to try and illustrate it. So in this case, if we could imagine, instead of the, the, the fluid being stationary while the particle moves through that cosmic fluid, um, the, the, the fluid itself is moving around the azimuth in the galaxy. And then Carmelli, adds, um, the, the, if you look at the notion where you go out to lower and lower uh, accelerations, you get to a point where the particle, and in this case keep your eye on the red one, where the accelerations are very weak, 
It's like the cosmic fluid that's moving due to this expansion in the plane of the galaxy is dragging that particle around with it. And so we can uh, solve the equations of motion for galaxies. And when we solve those equations, I won't show them to you, I, it, I discovered that there are two regimes. The green curve is the normal Newtonian physics that applies in our solar system, and it, and it should apply to galaxies. But the trouble is, that's where the anomaly comes in. We find that there seems to be two regions, a high acceleration region and a low acceleration region below the line. And Newtonian physics, the green curve, doesn't work here. But the Carmelian physics seems to say that in this low acceleration region, we see that the, uh, the, the force law drops off as 1 over r, 1 over the distance, not 1 over r squared, which you find in normal Newtonian physics. That's what you learned all learned in high school, which you've probably all forgotten by now. But that's, that's what normally we see, and that's what we even see in our solar system. But in galaxies, it seems like there's something else. Once you cross some critical type of acceleration level. And so using that, if we look at the normal Newtonian physics, you get that equation. That's what you all learned in high school. That's for circular motion. That applies beautifully. That's how we got the mass of the sun. The first slide came from that equation. That's how we calculated it. <coughs> but when you look at the weak acceleration region with the Carnelian physics, you get a different law. You get the, 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 the velocities, circulating velocities of those gases to the fourth power is proportional to the enclosed mass. That is the Tully-Fisher law. So Carnelian's theory actually derives a Tully-Fisher relationship. That, I felt, was very fascinating. So then I took his, his, uh, uh, his physics and solved it for the cylindrical mass densities that we see in, in, in galaxies, typical disk, disk galaxies. And it's, you see that Newtonian is the green curve. That's what you expect it to follow. To follow. So if you go from the center of the galaxy moving out, this is in kiloparsecs. That's like... Kiloparsec is a about 3,000 light year units, right? Something like that. So that's about 30,000 light years, that's 10, something like that. And you expect that it follows the green curve if Newtonian physics was all there was, but it doesn't, because this is what this anomaly is all about. But the Carmelian theory fits very well. These blue dots are actually observations of the rotation of the gases within this galaxies. And I looked at many different galaxies I'm not showing you anymore, but just a summary table. You see, these are the names of the galaxies. You calculate the mass of the galaxy from this, the dynamics, the dynamical mass, and you calculate it from Newtonian physics, and you calculate it from Parnelli physics, and you see the ratio. This is this ratio over here. That's that like mass to light ratio. So what that's saying is, that we don't need to propose dark matter, all we needed was new physics. So the new physics describes the motions of, of these galaxies with much less mass than, than the Newtonian physics required. And this is our galaxy, the Milky Way. You get four times less the amount of matter if you use the Carmelian uh, theory. And right where our solar system is, moving around the center of our galaxy, it, our, our solar system is moving much too fast. And so our, our own galaxy that's been proposed is full of dark matter. <coughs> this room right here is full of dark matter. It's passing through this room. 85% of the mass of this room is dark matter. Only 15% is us. Atoms and protons, the normal, you know, the normal stuff that we all are familiar with. But the rest of it, it's dark. You can't see it. You see? So in this case, so bear with me, you wonder where I'm going with this. No, no, there's no need to propose this fictitious stuff if you've got the right physics. And Einstein got rid of the, um, the dark matter in the solar system with the right physics. I'm saying it's possible Carmelli's found a way to describe uh, large-scale structures in the universe where instead of on small scale, go to large scale, 
where the accelerations are small, the forces are small, and you need new physics, and you can get rid of dark matter and also dark energy. So that's essentially what's happened. You solve that problem without the necessary fudge factors. Now, if we go to larger scales in the universe now, and to look at um, what started in about 1916 with Vesto Slifer, he was looking at galaxies all around him, around him with some, some of the large new telescopes like Wilson and Palomar. And he noticed in the light coming from the galaxies, he, he saw this, these spectra, and the spectral lines, that there are many, these lines come from the gases in the stars, you know, the different elements in the gases, he found that they were generally shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, which he interpreted as a Doppler effect. The idea that is uh, just like the radar camera or the, the, the police gun, you know, you're driving your car towards the, the police guy holding his radar gun and you're moving a bit too fast, well, the, uh, the radar signal goes out and back and the wavelengths get compressed so they can measure your speed. That's what a Doppler effect is. You're all familiar with that when you hear a train rush by or something, you hear the change in the pitch of the sound. That's a Doppler effect in sound, but the same thing happens with light. And so if you look at a, the light coming from the star and you split it up into the spectrum, you will see bright lines and dark lines, absorption and emission lines. And if you compare that spectrum with um, a laboratory sample, like here on the left, a lab source, you can find the same spectral lines that represent the atomic structures of the same gases. In fact, with helium, it was first discovered in the sun before it was ever discovered on Earth. That's why it's called helium, after the Greek god Helios, because of these spectral lines. They're a very, very good way to identify atomic species. And so then you compare the two, and you see that for the same gas in the star, the lines are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. Now you can apply that to stars, you can apply that to galaxies. And that's what happened. Most of the galaxies are out there, the light is red shifted. There are just a couple where the light from a few of the nearby galaxies is blue shifted. The Andromeda galaxy, which I'm sure you all know of, two and a half million light years away, is moving toward us about 100 kilometers per second. But don't worry, that's nothing. <laughs> You'll be long dead, long gone. So this is essentially what, what they measure, and uh, Edward Hubble, back in the 1920s, with his uh, student Humerson, um, uh, they measured these spectral lines, and eventually Hubble uh, realized, by measuring the distances to a lot of these nearby galaxies, that there was a relationship which has become called the Hubble Law. And that relationship simply is that the, 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 there's a proportionality. The greater the distance to the galaxy, the greater the redshift, which, of course, that has become called the Hubble Law. Well, at that time, that settled one of the great debates at the time about, um, number one, is everything we see out there our galaxy? Well, that answered the question, no, there are other galaxies, they call them nebulae. So that, that from that they realised that those nebulae were separate galaxies, just like our own, containing hundreds of billions of stars. <coughs> Not only that, they were moving away, that was the interpretation that the, the vast majority of the scientific community uh, held to, and Hubble, uh, and, and Hubble even published that, though I, I will add, he doubted that over quite some decades, even after this publication, even right into the uh, early 50s. But nevertheless, this was the beginning of the idea that the universe is expanding. And for those who are a little bit more scientifically inclined, you want an equation. This is essentially the, uh, the simple Hubble law. The redshift of the speed of recession is proportional to the distance. Okay, so based on this idea, of course, that we then saw the development of the standard model, the, the friedman lemaitre models were based on this idea, and of course they're founded on Einstein's general theory of relativity. Both these guys, Alexander Friedman and uh, Georges Lemaitre, found solutions for Einstein's field equations that then have become, these have become known as the standard model, if you like. 
Okay, but Carmelli's idea was to extend that onto a larger scale by adding an extra dimension. Really, it's sort of applied on the universe. It's sort of like he, he added this idea um, of this velocity dimension, this expansion of the universe, but the, the velocity of the expansion of the universe. Um, but in essence, it's really an extra dimension. I would add, that therefore, in Carmelli's theory, everything that applied in general relativity on the local scale, like in the solar system and so on, was already um, um, also true. But just on larger and larger scales, he added um, new physics. So Carmelli's model now, so he's got, you, you've got your, the, the general theory of, upon which Carmelli then builds a cosmological model, right? So his model is spherically symmetric isotropic expanding universe, which means if you can imagine it's something like a ball of dust and you're at the center of that ball of dust and you can look out in every direction, isotropic, doesn't mean necessarily homogeneous. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be uniform from every, every uh, point, but it's certainly true from the observer's point. That, that it's um, the same in every direction. The Hubble law is fundamental. It's like a basic axiom that the universe is expanding. And it's simple. It's only got a number of, a small number of measured observables. The distance to the galaxies in the expanding universe, their redshift, um, the matter density of the universe, this sort of thing. Very basic stuff. And in 1996, working around his kitchen table, this, uh, uh, Carmelli developed his theory and he made a prediction that the universe should not only be expanding, but that expansion should be accelerating. And that was discovered, or uh, two different teams made observations of high redshift supernova measurements, and they both published in 1998 that based on the standard model, though, not Carmelli's, but based on the standard model, they interpreted that data um, such that the idea of this acceler accelerating expansion. And these guys won the Nobel Prize for this in, mm -hmm. in uh, 2011. In order to measure uh, the, um, let's say, in order to test their model, they needed two independent parameters. <coughs> and, the, and what you can do is look in the universe for what we might call a standard light bulb or a standard candle, because if, if something's a standard, you know that if you increase the distance by, uh, say, double the distance, then the luminosity will go down by the square. This is the inverse square law of illumination, which you probably also all learnt in high school physics, which you forgot by right now. So what they looked out there in the universe for was a standard candle, something that had a standard brightness, and then they could look for it at greater and greater redshifts. What they found was there's a certain class of supernova, that are exploding stars, and this is the type 1a class that they looked at at certain characteristics. It's uh, you know based on a certain uh, history of the collapse of the, the progenitor star, and they thought they understood the physics well, and so this was chosen as a standard candle. And then, of course, you look at the um, the redshift of the host galaxy, so you see this case here, 1995, and then over here there's this exploding star in 2002, and you look at the redshift of the host galaxy, and so you get the brightness of that supernova, and you have the redshift, you've got two independent parameters, and you can test your model. And so they did, and this is the data here from one of those teams that, uh, that um, got the Nobel Prize, um, uh, this is a research L paper, and this is supplemented by some other data over here. And you see you have the distance modulus, this is luminosity, it's a measure of distance in the universe, and you have over here the redshift of those supernova. And so then you just plot this on a curve and you fit your theory to it, right? And you see what the best fit is. Well, I then decided, well, if they can fit their model, I'll fit the Carmelli model and see what happens. And so the red curve is the, is the uh, best fit curve to all of this data. And the green dash is the, uh, in the Carmelli model, but it's using dark matter 
26%, in other words, 22% dark matter and 4% normal matter, and, and the uh, red curve is just 4% normal matter. Well, the Carmelli model fitting the same data doesn't need any dark matter, and there's no yeah. dark energy in it anyway. So you fit the exact same data. And if we do have a look at what are called residuals, so you take that curve off and you can then see how well does it really fit. And the one that has the 4% normal matter fits the data really well, whereas the, uh, uh, the dark matter content one, 22% dark matter, uh, all that extra matter, the theory doesn't fit very well at all. So you see, what well, that's another way of saying you don't need dark matter in this model, right? And so then I decided, well, they also, uh, someone published a paper where they fitted to uh, even brighter sources, they're called gamma ray bursts. No one really yet understands what these are. These are explosions in space that emit enormous intensities of gamma rays. And that's the blue dots and, and the bars, the arrow bars. And they have them out to redshift of seven. Redshift of seven in our universe is right out uh, even on a Big Bang timeline to within only sort of like a billion years um, after the Big Bang. So it's an enormous distance um, in, in the cosmos. And so I applied the fits of the Carmelli model also, which is 2%, 4%, those curves, they fit very well, and, but fitting with the uh, higher dark matter content model doesn't fit well at all. So even out to enormous redshifts in the universe, the Carmelli model doesn't need any dark matter and it has no dark energy anyway. So the result of all that is, is that, remember we started with this, this is from those high redshift <coughs> supernova measurements, but using the standard Big Bang model, the friedman lamantra model. Once you apply the Carmelli model, you don't need it. You only need that little 4% of normal matter. They call it baryonic matter, which means neutrons and protons, that sort of stuff. And therefore, the problem solved. Remember, we got rid of the dark matter in the solar system. We got rid of the dark matter in the spiral galaxies and the clusters and to the big clusters. Now we've gotten rid of the dark matter in the whole universe. And also, there's no dark energy in there. It's not being assumed anyway. So the fudge factors have gone. Now, another interesting thing, and that is, is the universe homogeneous? Now, homogeneous means the distribution of galaxies is uniform throughout the whole universe. So we should have a look at what it looks like. Now, this is not looking at enormous distances. This is uh, right here is uh, where we are located in space, and every dot on this is a galaxy. The distance out to here is something like about 3 billion light years, something like that. So that's like, you know, in terms of the size of the universe, um, it's 10% or something of that size, right? In terms of the volume of the universe. Not enormous, it's big, right? It's big, but it's not, it's not right out there. There's uh, uh, several hundred thousand galaxies that uh, are plotted on a plane here, projected onto a plane from this Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Now you see there's this sort of web-like structure, you see voids and filaments, but can you see anything else in this structure? Remember, our galaxy is located around here, at the centre of this apex. By the way, those wedges are just an artefact, because they're only mapping that part of the sky. And the reason they're only mapping that part of the sky is because our, this is the plane of our galaxy, and so you can't look a crop along the disk of our galaxy. You wouldn't see anything. So that's like looking up above and below the plane of our galaxy. Okay? It looks like there's waves moving out in the centre. Yeah, so I have maybe biased you a little bit to your eye here, but I've drawn concentric circles centred on our on Earth, which is really where our galaxy is, because the galaxy is just a dot, you know. And you see there are actually concentric structures there. Now, um, you don't have to believe me in this, but we can apply mathematical tools to this. We can do uh, Fourier analysis to see if there's any real structure in that. And that's what we did, yes. Uh, that's completely false. That's false colour um, colour coding. The false colour coding is just based on the absolute magnitudes of the galaxies they're looking at. So it, it's, it has no, no other um, okay. meaning than that. Sorry, then what are the uh, units that you've got? 
Okay, the units are in redshift. So these are redshift intervals going out. Okay. Yeah. So you see that's 0.1 something, 0.7, nearly 0.2 redshift out there. So it's periodic structure. Uh, that period is roughly um, every 250 million light years. There's like a shell of galaxies. So if I could sort of give you an, uh, sort of an analog to this, is something like if you took an onion and sliced through a center of an onion, you could imagine you've got layers and layers of an onion. So that's like galaxies are preferentially with a small bias, not strongly, but weakly, tend to lie on the surfaces of these concentric shells, right? Not strongly, I said, there's still random, there's still web, there's still filamentary structure in that. But we can look at that mathematically and um, the maths bears out in this. And so there's a couple of possibilities because one of the real subtleties here is this, and you may not get this, but we're not actually measuring distance. Now, I've been talking about distance all the way through here, but we're not. Redshift is not distance. Redshift is the shift of those spectral lines. And unfortunately, there are not many measures of distance, particularly once you get um, away from our nearby galactic neighbourhood, well beyond the scale of what I showed you. Uh, you have nothing but the Hubble law. So the Hubble law, remember, measures the redshift of the galaxies, and so by measuring their redshift, it becomes a proxy for distance. Mm. So redshift, in a sense, then, could be just a uh, measure of um, past epochs of time. And so one of the possibilities is that if you could imagine the universe has no unique centre, the galaxies uh, only appear to be in shells, because over the past epochs of the history of the universe, the expansion of the universe has oscillated. In other words, the expansion rate has gone up and gone down in a periodic way. And so it would only appear like there's a bullseye pattern when we look out into the cosmos. That would be an artifact of the redshift space, not of real space, yes. Did, is that like, because I've, I've been told that wherever you stand in the universe, like as you look out, it looks like you're the centre. But is that the, is that, is that the science behind that now, statement? Yes, yes, yes and no. That, yeah, but you're quite right. Now that's an assumption, that's a cosmological principle, right? Oh, yeah, I, get, I know that, right. that it's not necessarily that's right. true. So the difficulty in this, in proving this, is because if this is a redshift space effect, then the center of these, cosmic, these shells, these cosmic shells, should be exactly at the observer because it's not real space. It's only a, yeah. a, 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 a sort of a, an apparent effect due to the motion, the past motion of the expand, expansion of the universe. Yeah. And so if this idea were true, then that would be seen by any observer anywhere in the yeah. because it's only a, a sort of an apparent effect, a projection effect, if you like. Mm -hmm. But if you could show that the true centre of these cosmic shells is not on the observer, is somewhere else, then that would tell you that it's real space effect. So that's the second possibility. Um, on, on the first possibility, though, I published a paper in 2008 with a, with a co-author where we showed strong this... Um, Periodic redshift effect was very strong. And this is further being, we're now further investigating this because I uh, want to take into account all types of selection effects and biases and things like that. So um, um, this research is actually still ongoing, it's not complete. But um, the, uh, the uh, other possibility, as I've indicated, it could mean that we live in an isotropic universe, meaning the same, we see the same pattern in every direction, but we have a unique centre. The galaxies then are in shells at discrete, or at least sort of, there's a bias towards lie at these preferred distances. And as I indicated, um, one way to test that would be to see if we could find whether or not the centre of those shells, uh, number one, are they all concentric on each other? And number two, where is the, um, the, the uh, centre itself? And I did it in 
analysis on that and found that the preferred centre of that structure is not at the Earth, but is about 100 million light years away. Cosmologically, that's actually still pretty close. <laughs> in other words, cosmologically, we could say we're in a near galactocentric universe <coughs> because on the scale of the cosmos, billions and billions of light years to be only the centre, be only 100 million light years away from the centre is, is nothing. It's very tiny, right? But there's a it's weak effect. But the, the, the analysis, the mathematical analysis, indicates that um, it's off centre from where we are, from where our galaxy is. And of course, 100 million light years is much larger than um, the scale size of our galaxy. It's only 100,000 light years across. So that's at least 10 galaxies away in terms of if you line them up side by side. Still close, but um, uh, still a long way away on our scale of things. And uh, also last year I published a paper with this idea, this is Carmelian cosmology, but one of the potential solutions, remember Carmelian's idea was uh, a pretty much a Big Bang universe from the singularity. Well I also find that you can have a finite bounded expanding universe <coughs> that has exactly the same solutions as the ones that Carmelian found. Exactly the same solutions and therefore fits all of the same data that I've explained to you already. <coughs> but in this case, this cosmology um, is a finite universe, has a unique centre, and our galaxy could be somewhere near that unique centre. That is a, a, a solution. And that paper I published uh, last year, International Journal of Theoretical Physics. And so, if you could imagine then, the universe is something like a white hole. I say white hole because it's sort of like the opposite of a black hole. Um, our galaxy is somewhere near the centre and all matter is flowing out from that centre, right? Sort of flowing out, words. And so we're sort of somewhere near that and we see matter all rushing away from us. And it's a real space effect. Now, that's sort of in contradiction to the cosmological principle because in the cosmological principle, they say that's what any observer anywhere in the universe would see, and it's only a, a, a sort of a, uh, you might say, it's an optical or sort of a, a apparent effect because all <coughs> galaxies are rushing away from every point in space. So it would appear like everybody is at the center of um, the universe, right? But this solution I found, it has a unique center. Only one, not many. And that is also valid. It produces the same uh, uh, field of uh, 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 equations of motion to describe the universe um, as Carmelli did in his more general solution. You see, um, we are told that this issue to do with this assumption of uniformity, this cosmological principle. But I like this quote by Richard Feynman, famous physicist. He says, I suspect the, uh, that the assumption of uniformity of the universe reflects a prejudice born of a sequence of overthrow of geocentric ideas. It would be embarrassing to find, after stating we live in an ordinary planet about an ordinary star, in an ordinary galaxy, that our place in the universe is extraordinary. To avoid embarrassment, we cling to the hypothesis of uniformity. <coughs> it's certainly possible that we live in a special place in the universe, and that our galaxy is somewhere near at least the local universe, you know, out to several uh, billion light years radius, which would must include many, many, many millions of galaxies, and we're somewhere near the local centre of that structure, some superstructure uh, of galaxies all around us. Okay, so this is the cosmology, and uh, essentially now. That cosmology and, and my finite solution uh, version are general. They're quite general. You know. Now, the reason I say, but wait, and you know, late, very late at night on television, if you're ever watching that, not that I watch television, um, <laughs> there's more, right? And there's more because we can now use that cosmology to apply it to a solution to a problem that creationists have had. And that problem is that, um, illustrated by this slide, really, 
that if the universe is so large, which I'm not doubting it is, and I, so I'm just illustrating here by a couple of galaxies that are nearby, I mentioned Andromeda before, two and a half million light years away, and the Large Magellanic Cloud is only 170,000 light years away. In 1978, we saw a supernova, it's called Supernova 1978A, letter A, because it was the first one. 1987. What did I say? Oh, well, a bit dyslexic, you know. <laughs> it's like DNA, the National Dyslexic Association. <laughs> so we saw that in 1987. It was the first supernova that year. And so, so the question is, how is that possible if the universe is only 6,000 years old, as described by adding up the genealogies in, in Genesis? Right? How is that even possible? because I've drawn a circle here around our position on our galaxy, and that circle there is the 6,000 light year radius around our, our solar system in our galaxy. Right, so how do we see anything outside that, that radius? And that's been the problem that's called the light travel time problem, right, for creationists, if you believe the universe is only 6,000 years old. I mentioned Andromeda because we see supernova in Andromeda. The very reason I mentioned supernova is because supernova are beautiful light shows that carry information. Like stars are not just blobs, they, they, they carry a whole lot of information. And so um, that's the problem. How does light get here from even nearby ones, let alone galaxies 10 billion light years away? And how does the light traverse the distance and get here within the available time that according to the Bible is 6,000 years roughly as measured by Earth clocks. Important little statement I just added on there because time we measure locally. In Carmelli's model, to little, go back, stepping back a little bit, this is somewhat of a toy model because it really tells you a little bit about Einstein developed his special theory of relativity, which was a, a theory of space and time. Carmelli came along and created his own sort of analog theory, which was a theory of space and velocity, called it cosmological special relativity. It's like an analog. He just replaced the velocity with the time and the equations and had this sort of analog theory. But then when you combine it all together, you get this five-dimensional theory of space and time and velocity, this velocity of the expansion. And these two sort of toy theories really live in the extremes. Special relativity lives in this sort of um, very low, um, uh, low, the regime of no expanding universe, put it that way. That's the best way to describe it. You know, what we experience in our life, we don't see any effect of the expansion of the universe. Right? In fact, it's impossible to measure locally. That's another whole discussion. But the uh, cosmological uh, special relativity theory is like on the opposite side. It's like in, an, in, it's in the extreme where we see no effects of time. It's like time almost doesn't exist. But we see redshift, we see the redshift of those galaxies, and it's like when we look at the universe, it's like taking a still photograph. And that's why I mean like it's like a snapshot of time. Time is like paused or stopped in a sense. And there's those two extremes. And the idea is to put those extremes together. And that's what Carmelli did. But of course, you have to look at the real universe, of course, as well. Now, with that theory, if you look at then the universe based on the five-dimensional theory, then you can imagine clocks. They're called co-moving clocks. They're moving out with the all the galaxies in the universe, if you can imagine these hypothetical clocks. If you crank the handle and do the physics, you get an equation like this. And in that equation, you see this acceleration of the expansion of the universe uh, with respect to Earth clocks. And that number can be very large. So that means that Earth-based atomic clocks tick much slower than the uh, atomic clocks that are moving out in those galaxies, if you get what I mean. Or you could imagine the other way around, that the rate at which the clocks on the galaxies are ticking as compared to the same sort of clocks on Earth are much, much, much faster, right? 
Of course, the theory doesn't tell you when this type of thing happens, simply says if, you ex if the universe is expanding, then this, is, this equation applies. Excuse me, don't yeah. again just remember the units. Tor is what, Hubble constant, is it? It's a constant, yeah. The Hubble constant? It's the inverse of it. The inverse of yeah. C speed of light, yeah. the V to T, the V being the velocity that can come in. Is that the perfect? This is velocity, yes. The velocity of expansion. Right. Okay. So the rate of change of that velocity of expansion. Okay. Yes. I, I, I think I think I almost got that. <laughs> can, you, can you say it again? About the universe expanding so the clocks out there are going faster. Yeah. So if you imagine it's not just expansion, because if it was constant rate of expansion, that would be zero and you have no solution. It's yeah. acceleration. Oh, so if the universe is expanding and it's accelerating rate. Right? Exactly. Oh, okay. Now that number, now this is this is just there's nothing in the theory to tell you about that number because you can't really even measure it because it's against Earth clocks. Mm. And there's no way, and this is part of the problem of cosmology, it's not like we can do a lab experiment. We yeah. can't. We're limited to a theory and to the outcomes of our observations. Mm. And so there's no way to actually measure that number. So that, we could say, was very, very great in the past. And I'll just save it to a point when I'll discuss it a little bit more. But I posit, or I make the assumption that that all happened on day four of creation week. Because in the Bible, God said he made the stars and the galaxies by inference, and that, as I'll explain in a minute, that that seems to flow naturally out of this idea. So just save that for a second. Now, in the real universe, of course, the real universe is filled with matter. Because if there's no matter, actually, there's no universe, right? We're not even here to discuss it. So in a real universe, we need general relativity that describes a universe of space and time and matter and how that matter curved the space-time. Remember in that geometrical representation I showed you? Well, then Carnally had also a cosmological general relativity of space and velocity and then combined them together. And in his combined theory is where the equations came for the this rotation curves of galaxies and clusters and so on. That's where that came from, right? So that's the real universe. And you might imagine now that in a real universe, um, the universe is expanding, but what do we mean by that? Well, it's actually the material content. Cosmologists have a term, it's called the cosmic substratum. That's like the smoothed out matter density of the universe, like the, the, the particle fluid that the universe is really made from. Does space exist? Not really. It allows matter to exist. Space and time permit matter to exist. That's why we exist, because we occupy space and time, right? So as that fluid expands out in the real universe, the density of that fluid affects the universe. Right? There's nothing new in that. That's in general relativity as well. Well, that's also true in his uh, five-dimensional theory. So if you then look at that theory, you can now construct what you might imagine to be the speed of light coming from the distant galaxies, if you can imagine that for a minute. You can uh, calculate what that speed might be, this here. This is the square of the speed of the light coming in. Now, C in that equation is the normal speed of light, which is constant throughout the whole universe. It doesn't vary. If you're in any local uh, physics, you, anywhere in the universe, it's just normally C, the normal speed of light. Nothing changes. But we can calculate what I call one way in inverted commas, but I put it in inverted commas for other reasons. <coughs> Another whole discussion about what the one way speed of light is. But here we can calculate the sort of apparent speed of light coming from the distant cosmos. I'm not saying the speed of light changes, by the way, it's constant. I'm saying it's something you might calculate, not measure, just calculate based on Earth clocks, Earth atomic clocks. And essentially that's all one, and then that number is quite small, and so you only again have this acceleration term. And if that acceleration term is very large, you can make the approximation here, and you find that this 
number here can be extremely large indeed. Therefore, it's like an apparent enormous speed of light. Like maybe if you could imagine the speed of light, um, normal speed of light we know is C, 300,000 kilometers per second, this thing could be like 10 trillion times faster, for example. Something like that, right? No problem, you could put that in. Of course, I make the assumption that this did happen actually on day four of creation week. And therefore, that solves the Starlight Travel Time problem. So, what in, in fact really is happening is that the Earth clocks tick about a trillion times slower or than the cosmic clocks, or conversely, the cosmic clocks tick about a trillion times faster <coughs> during that initial rapid expansion of the cosmos on day four of creation week. And because of that process, there's billions of years of time available in the cosmos while only one day passes on Earth. And so the reason you would calculate that fast speed of light is only because of Earth time. In reality, it travels at normal speed all the way here, taking uh, billions of years uh, in cosmic time to get to Earth while only 24 hours passes on Earth. That's the, yeah. You say this only happened at that time. Yes. Uh, doesn't that happen now, still? In a sense, yes, that's true. But therefore, what we would have to say now, what is now? Is there any, like... Um, That's a really hard question to answer because time depends on the observer. And we are in a special frame. We are here on Earth. In, in, and I would even go as far as to say in a special place in the universe. And all of the Bible, all of the biblical description and language is focused on Earth. Now, I can't prove that we're in the centre of the universe, I'm not going to say that, but I'm saying the evidence is consistent with it. And the language of the Bible is that God is, has focused his attention on us, on man, and it's, we are in a significant place. So, I would then say that in current epoch we look out into space and what we see coming from space, that if we look past the 6,000 light years, according to my uh, theory and the assumption that have happened on day four, it's only an assumption, that's all, that if that is true, then everything we see beyond 6,000 light years is from day four of creation week. So that's like then looking back into the past. But before we move on, let me just give you this one little animation that gives you the idea. You see the cosmic clocks are ticking really fast compared to Earth clocks on this day four during this expansion process. And then at the end of day four, the acceleration stops. The expansion can go on, but the acceleration stops and all clocks tick at the same rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it valid for me to put it this way? You're saying that there's this big dilation of time yes. out there and in here. Yeah. And it's really big because on day four of creating, God created and spread it out yes. real fast. Yes. And if He hadn't spread it out real fast, it wouldn't be so obvious. I mean, that's a certain question too. Um, it's because there's this enormous spreading out of the cosmos early in creation that all this time stuff happens. Exactly. I'm saying that. And in fact, a bit more, which I'll answer in a second. So this solves this problem, and we can also calculate what's called the, um, the light um, travel time. We can calculate how long it would take the light to travel um, in Earth clock time, right? Now, I don't build clocks. It's important to know which clocks you are talking about, because it's Earth clocks, and that's why I threw that expression in. Earth clocks. So in Earth time, how long does it take the light to travel from the distant cosmos? This equation comes from cranking the handle and doing the physics. And this uh, parameter eta is unknown, of course. This is the, uh, the, the amount of that acceleration, how fast that was. So if you put in a couple of numbers, for example, I put in uh, 10 to the 12, which is a trillion times, and 10 to the 13, 10 trillion times, 
the transit time from the edge of the universe to Earth can be just one day. In fact, when you think about it, that because God made everything in the cosmos on one day, it has to be one day. It can't be anything else. It can't be <coughs> one day because he did it all in one day. So if you put it in for it to all happen on one day, then the light all gets here by the end of the same day. It has to. It's a requirement. You get that? What I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. Humphrey's gravity well next to the white hole. Is this in any way a light? No. You, need? you don't need to have that white hole nearby proximity? No, right? when I said white hole, I sort of used that in inverted commas because it's white hole is a space time construct. Yeah. And this model is not space time. So it's not quite the same thing. You don't require the gravity to no. slow our clock. It's not gravity. The mechanism of time dilation in this model is not gravity. Not at all. It's due to acceleration of the expansion of that cosmic substratum, whatever that stuff is, that the universe is made of. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the universe still expanding? Um, that's another very good question. So, um, <coughs> it just expands for one day. No, I'm We're saying now, if, if this, let, let's just back that up a bit and say, in the context of this model, the universe can still be expanding. We can okay. say that. So right. wouldn't the clock still be going faster out there than here? No, because, because it's based on acceleration. Right. Acceleration. So the question then is, what, what is the universe when you think about it? Now this, this, is, this probably is why um, people who got those degrees called PhDs a long time ago were called doctors of philosophy, because they actually just spend all their time sitting in some room thinking about these things. And when you think about the universe, really, well, what is the universe? Um, it is actually a big problem because it involves space and time, right? Yeah. But which time is in the universe? Which events? Because according to general relativity, there could be events that are not in the universe. And so this becomes a serious problem to fully understand. I don't think you can have an event in, outside of all that there is. You need space and time are to make it happen. You have kind of sort of defined it in that way, but in, in general relativity, there can be events that are called outside our light cone, which can, we could never see. Therefore, if we never see them, they're not in our universe. Okay. You see? And so, our universe in that sense, in general relativity, then gets to define what's inside our light cone. Everything that mm -hmm. uh, can communicate but with us. But there's a different understanding of what the word universe is. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. that's right. And of course, this has been extrapolated now into multiverse. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have bubble universes and none of them like, sort of interact with our universe either. Yeah. So, so you're saying that uh, basically for the entire day, it's continuously accelerating yes. hours. Uh, is there any effect on the deceleration? That, uh, or does it just Look, when, I, when I sort of uh, calculated these equations, I just assumed a step function. A very, very steep okay. step function. Okay. But so it's, just, it's just a model, right? It's yeah. a model. What happens on the edges? Interesting questions. Um, and another question about the, you said it looked like uh, it was uh, accelerating in a sinusoidal uh, motion. Now that's an interpretation, one interpretation of how you could interpret those concentric structure rings in redshift space. That's that's a possible interpretation. Yeah. But if it's real space, it's not a it's not a redshift space effect. It's actually a, a real space effect. But there's two possibilities there, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> One or the other, but not not together. Can I just hold questions for a little bit? Okay. <laughs> so um, so therefore, if we can then um, imagine on that day four of creation week when God said he created the stars, therefore, as I said, by inference, the galaxies, the, really the, the, the most of the content of the universe. Um, we can look at the Carmelian theory, and in the Carmelian theory, due to the expansion process, there's a very interesting thing that falls out of this. If you assume now the universe is isentropic, that's not isotropic, isentropic, it means it can, entropy is, um, um, it's a sort of a, a no change in entropy, it's a constant entropy expansion. 
And the only way I can imagine that could happen is, is by a creator. Because normally entropy always increases. Only way it can remain a, a constant is, is by, I think, by design. If you make that assumption and you expand the universe out of the uh, cosmic substratum, you might call it vacuum, but meaning it's the, that, that smooth average density of the fluid of the universe, um, matter pops out of it for conservation of energy reasons. And this has been um, hydrodynamically modeled and you, for conservation of energy reasons, uh, matter has to be created. Not out of nothing, not ex nihilo. The energy's there, it's just converted from energy to matter. And do we see that sort of particle production? If we look out in the cosmos, we see these type of images. And this is one that's uh, quite famous called the, the Qatar. <coughs> Qatar, doesn't it, don't you think? I reckon it does. <laughs> and uh, Arp is one of the, uh, he, he died actually, mm -hmm. just in, after Christmas, but Alton Arp is, was a, a radical astronomer with a radical views. And um, we've got a few elliptical galaxies here, and you have a quasar over here, a very high redshift object that um, is uh, yeah, very high redshift. In the standard model, high redshift means very, very distant, right? But these galaxies are fairly low redshift. This elliptical is only 0.083, which is fairly nearby, more or less, probably several hundred million light years away, but considered to be um, relatively nearby. And you see the little tiny ones that have been arrowed here? Arthur's saying, even this one, that these are ejections. Vague galaxies ejected out of the hearts of active, um, get, sort of, active nuclei of, of the big mother galaxy. That matter is created or ejected out of the hearts of other galaxies. And this is a, a galaxy formation process. Now you can see why he wasn't really <laughs> too favoured by the standard uh, uh, community, uh, astrophysics community, because this seems to be, you never read this in a textbook, except that it was one that he had written himself. And there are a couple, this one's out of his book called Seeing Red, uh, which you can buy. Um, and he, he proposes this idea that you see matter being created, sort of like those fireworks nights. You go outside and the embers explode up there, and they come out, and then on the tips of those embers, they explode again. And you see this sort of hierarchy, or hierarchy of um, ejection of active uh, galaxies ejecting, baby galaxies maturing and ejecting more in this grand process. And this was his idea, but it seems to me this is an observation that would fit very nicely with the Creator God creating on day four of Creation Week and would fit into this process when we see this rapid acceleration of this fabric of space, or the sub cosmic substratum, which I'm very much liking that word nowadays, and you see a creation process going on. You see, um, I highlight this particular quasar here because we often see quasars in these type of uh, association with active um, parent galaxies. But this particular one here is one that critics can't answer. Because in this case, the quasar is this one right here, and it's in front of the nucleus of a disturbed spiral galaxy. The quasar has a very high redshift, so it should be billions and billions and billions of light years, probably 10 billion light years away under the Hubble law. You know, the standard model interpretation of the Hubble law, and the galaxy itself is very low, only several hundred million light years away. So it should be relatively close. Yet how can you have something that is meant to be right out on the edge of the visible universe in front of a, a, a nearby galaxy? Makes no sense. Well, how in, can you? You can't. In fact, as you know, you only need one contradiction to a rule to break the rule. And this is one right here breaks the rule. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, how, how do you know that is in front of it? I mean, it might appear to be behind it and like, it's still going through, it's not like a solid yeah. object. Okay, very, that's true, and that would probably be what the other camp would say. But also, it's very hard to justify, because it's, it's very close to the nucleus, 
And remember, this would be um, one of the, you know, part of the objects that are the most distant in the universe. So in summary, uh, we see um, that our galaxy is at the centre, I should say, near, in a sort of a galactocentric universe kind of way. Um, of an expanding universe that we see all, all this galaxy arrayed around us in some sort of um, uh, semi-concentric uh, shell structure. I say semi because there's only a bias for some of them to lie on these concentric shells. Um, we see this expansion powered by some energy in the vacuum of the cosmic substratum. Uh, in fact, it has to be put there by God, it has to be part of the creation process. Where it's, this is about first cause now, where did that come from? And we are looking back into creation week and uh, uh, maybe seeing those creation uh, processes of day four. Uh, the universe is open and ex expanding and accelerating and as I've shown you, I've got a model of even finite, unique centre, finite universe. So this idea that we have a finite distribution of stars and, it, and if you went out past them, you come to the edge and there's just no more stars, you know, there's, there's nothing. And then there's a very interesting question after that. If there's nothing after it, what is there? Because I would argue that space only exists because of the presence of matter. If there's no matter there, what is there? Uh, there's no exotic, I use the word exotic dark matter here because of course there can be dark matter stuff we can't see, you know, like burnt out stars and planets and things like that, but that's nothing in the scheme of things of what we're talking about. None of that is the, by, by any amount enough to supply the 22% of dark matter that's needed in the standard model, and there's no dark energy. Um, the current matter density of the universe is about this 4%. That, that's a fraction of what's called critical density, by the way, but it's just details you don't really need to know. So really, all the matter content of the universe is all, the, the normal matter, that is, the protons and neutrons, is all there is. That's it, that's the 100% of all matter. There may be some of it we can't see, is what I'm saying, a small fraction, but it's normal matter. Light arrives within thousands of years um, by earth clocks at the most and as I argued earlier the, uh, during that creation day process um, uh, in the initial the initial arrival of light has to be in one day it's just that now within 6,000 years you can say how long has it taken the light from creation to get to earth it's the same answer it's 6,000 years whatever the number is plus a day you understand what I'm saying so the travel time is that one day plus whatever length of time it's been since creation. In my calculation the other day I got 6,188 I think it was. I just added up the genealogy. <laughs> you can do your own exercise. Bishop Asher got, what, 4,004 BC for creation. And the radius of the universe is around about the number that we are told, around about 13.5 billion uh, light years. Um, the, to the edge of the visible uh, galaxy, so high redshift, seven or eight, nine. Yeah, I think there's got a few. There's one galaxy they've measured at ten. Not much out there, but of course we can't see. Right, the further and further you go out, the less you can see. And um, that that's fine. That matches this this model. The space or the structure of space is we, is Euclidean. It's often what they call flat space. It doesn't mean it's like a pancake. It just means it's normal Euclidean geometry. Right? Triangles have 180 degrees and all that sort of stuff. That's all in the model. And it's interesting because a friend of mine just recently published a paper based on, on Carmelli's cosmological general relativity theory. And he introduced a scale factor, something like in the standard model, and he decided he would investigate with dark energy and even dark matter, he allowed them. He allowed these as free parameters. So he added them back in as free parameters and then he fit the model to the data with dark energy content and dark matter content as free parameters. You understand what I mean? And to see what the best fits were with these free parameters. And they're very small. 
They're so small, in fact, you can just throw them away and it doesn't affect the fits. So, in other words, even when you add them in with, the, with that theory, with that particular cosmology, you don't need them. So even when you put them back and see if it's of any value to have them there at all, you find out it's just that they're, they're a waste of space. You don't need them. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, I've written a book on this subject called Starlight Time and the New Physics, as I've mentioned, and there's the DVDs, which we've got two copies over there on the book table. Um, if anyone's <coughs> interested in buying this book, you can buy it from um, creation.com. We also are willing to take the money off you tonight and post it to you, um, so no extra charge. So in other words, it will zip you bought it here tonight. Um, and I've brought a few copies along on dismantling the Big Bang. Alex Williams and I wrote some years ago where we looked at the um, issues in the Big Bang, the, the scientific and philosophical assumptions, and um, we realised from this analysis that the biblical description is a far better history than any uh, description in the Big Bang universe. It gives all the glory to God when you look at it that way. And if you're, I write now a blog, johnhartner.org, I've only started around Christmas or before Christmas, and uh, I try to write some fairly simple articles on that blog. I know some of them end up being a bit more complicated, but, um, and uh, creation.com also has many uh, thousands of articles, and, and I've published a, a lot on that website. Okay, thank you very much. Well, while we're, when we're having our discussion time, it's more sort of a, um, you, know, a, a you know, everyone can contribute and ask questions. Um, and you've got some questions there. Are they These Kevin's? Are, these are Kevin's. Oh, so I don't have to ask them then. I've printed them live. All right. So I could read them. No, do you want me to ask them? If you like. I won't even get it on my email, will I? Hmm. Um, so, um, who'd like to start, or shall, shall Kevin no, start? No, I'd like to start. Okay, go for it, Brian. Uh, one of the things you were pointing out was particularly with that quasar and the galaxy, and saying that the redshift didn't necessarily mean the distance. So if redshift and distance aren't directly related, um, on what basis do you see the size of the universe being put into the public in light years or whatever? Okay, all right, this, so really two questions. To, to, we, have to separate the universe, yeah. we need to separate these ideas. So let's assume, number one, that Hubble law does apply to field galaxies. And on that basis, then we talk about the, <coughs> the, the, what, you know, the distant galaxies. Um, I'm not saying I believe that's true. I'm just saying if that is the case, then, then the redshifts of the field galaxies, is, um, their redshift is some kind of measure of distance. Quasars seem to be very distinct, different type of uh, species, um, has a totally different type of spectrum, um, and based on that, either A, they are black holes emitting an enormous amount of energy, and we see them down their spin axis, so we see that very um, luminous uh, emission along their polar axis, or they're something else like our suggestion, some type of embryonic matter, which um, is not really a black hole at all, but some type of exploding, expanding object, you know, maybe a white hole. But I'm not suggesting it's the classical concept of a white hole, <coughs> um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. So, Arp has suggested, uh, he's on one ex ex extreme end here, he, he has suggested that all redshifts are in doubt because of this. Others have compromised and said, okay, the, um, the, the sort of the non-active field-type galaxies, their redshifts seem to be cosmological. So there are different kind of positions there. Um, so it's really that, that's the, the basis. So, so in the Carmelli, of course, he accepts the standard interpretation of the other lords. It's the fundamental axiom in the cosmology, and, um, and so therefore, uh, redshift is a distance measure. Yeah. Right. 
thank you for that lecture. I understood a quarter of it. <laughs> and wow. So I'm still defending myself now because of my historically clash. Um, but at the beginning, it seemed to me, though, this dark energy and dark matter idea that scientists come up with in order to get the galaxies to move properly. And they just invented it. it was, and I'm not putting this against you, but I've got the impression it was sort of too early for it was a little bit strange to do that. But when we got to the end of it, where we're trying to work out um, the 250,000 light years, I think it was, uh, to Earth as opposed to the 6,000 years of Earth, we had day four where everything accelerated, went yeah. extra fast. Is it just from a, you know, without getting too mathematical, just from my intuition, intuitive idea is that the dark matter like, hypothesis is no, we are not no weird. Thank you. Fair, fair enough. Going to be good. And no weirder than the other one. Okay, so what you're really saying is it's not weird to propose some unknown. No. And, and, and in physics, I totally agree with you. It's not. So dark matter in this case then becomes sort of a proxy for unknown physics. Correct. Well, I think that's our science. Yeah. <laughs> However, uh, what the problem is is what is parsimonious. What is the simplest explanation? And. So you have to think in terms of, I'm not against dark matter per se, <coughs> but dark matter is uh, only kept alive, and remember that we've for 40 years now looked for dark matter in laboratory experiments without any success at all. It's kept alive because of its need in the standard model. And is it still correct? Like if you did some sort of laboratory <coughs> experiment and you proposed something, you did your experiments for 40 years and never detected it, and you didn't discard the model, you would be considered crazy. But in cosmology, that never happens. It's, you always keep, they just, you just continue to add on, add on. And so the free parameters now, in the standard model, are, I think it's up to about like 18 free parameters. So is that the most parsimonious model? when we don't know what dark matter is, we don't know what dark energy is, we don't know really what inflation is, and if even inflation were true, we don't know what the inflaton field is, we don't know what caused it to start, we don't know what caused it to stop. We don't know really <coughs> this cosmic micro background radiation, which is real stuff. We don't know if that is actually from the Big Bang fireball. We can't, we can't know that. And the problem is, it doesn't cast shadows in the foreground of galaxies. So that's also another, you see what I'm saying in that sense? Does space actually expand is another good question. You can't measure it. There's no lab experiment you could ever do to measure it, even the expansion of space. But then there's a whole host of other things. Have you heard of dark radiation? You yeah. have. Energy. Dark radiation is a sterile neutrino. <coughs> being proposed because when you measure the mass of the universe, say using cosmic micro background radiation or using using high redshift supernova measurements, you get two different answers and they're not overlapping. And so you propose in the early Big Bang and then nuclear synthesis process, there was another neutrino, a fourth one. And because it's sterile, it doesn't act, interact with matter, it doesn't interact with, I mean, not matter, I should say radiation, any type of electromagnetic radiation. You can't see it, so it's dark radiation. So again, it's, it, so I'm not against the idea of proposing a new particle or something, but it's, is it parsimonious we, if you just keep adding on? Like you have many, many, many add-ons. And that's not the end of it. You've got your spontaneous generation of the universe from nothing. Um, again, it's another unknown. You have this singularity that forms out of, out of the false vacuum. You propose the false vacuum to exist and the current laws of physics apply before the origin of the universe. That's, that's the most special pleading I've ever heard of. You, know, you might as well say God existed. Yeah, well, that's where I was going to come. You might as well say that. So, in a sense, if, if, say, for example, dark matter was the only thing that was being proposed in the cosmos to explain a whole host of inexplicable, inexplicable stuff, I would think it's, it's reasonable. But because it's and, and because of the direction it's come from, it's not. And the other people who have come up with some very good ideas, MONS, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, by uh, Mordecai Milgram, it's been around a long time, explains rotation curves, it's new physics, it's not dark matter. 
he is, even though he's publishing and all, um, he's considered to be a sort of a, a fringe guy. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's because of this parsimonious, or lack of parsimony, whatever the noun is, <laughs> if it exists, um, because of this problem, you see, and, and because there's so many free problems. And that's the reason I say it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in, in one sense that then mm-hmm. goes to something we've discussed in reasonable faith a number of times is it's, it's reasonable faith. It's not that you're going to, through reason, prove your mm-hmm. faith. But no. you look at all these various different theories and, and you go, okay, well, the God of hypothesis is one. <laughs> and it's reasonable. Yeah. yeah. That means there's a lot of bad science, well, bad science going on. Um, because, you know, like, there have been other people in history who've come up with some wacky idea which proved to be true. Yeah. And scientists got, got on board when the evidence was there. Yeah. You know what I'm and so, from my point of view, I must wonder what, why they have, haven't picked on some of these other things you'll mention. Well, cosmology is a different type of science mm. altogether, right? Mm. It's not experimental mm. science. Mm. But, I don't think most of the cosmologists understand that. There are some who mm-hmm. do, but the vast majority don't. They think they can do, say, some experiment with a large hadron collider, and they're doing the same physics that occurs in the Big Bang. But what if there wasn't a Big Bang? That they would never dream of. Well, some of that is to do with the stars at the moment, isn't it? That happens to be the stars that have a very prime resolution. Uh, not to the energies that yeah. they're talking about. The energies in the Big Bang nucleus synthesis are way beyond the temperatures inside the center of stars. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask a question from Kevin, who was very yeah. disappointed that he's not here? Yeah. Um, there's a few, but I'll start with the first one. John's model, your model, proposes that time dilation can be caused by the expansion of space, with this difference in time. Um, in, i.e., God stretched out the heavens, and that caused distant clocks to run faster than earth clocks by a factor of more than a trillion. Mm-hmm. Okay, Kevin's question is why does the expansion of space cause time dilation? <coughs> it's called causality. It's the same question as why do clocks speed up or slow down in, in, in a, the, the, the twin parallel. It's, it's, it's a relativistic effect. Okay. Expansion of space doesn't cause anything. It's causality. Okay. Um, I, I don't get it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really proves it's mathematics, isn't it? No, it's, it's, the, it's the relativity of the observer. In so, other words, it's something that we perceive. So, like, for example, um, uh, high-energy uh, cosmic particles like... Um, um, muons or something come into our upper atmosphere and moving near the speed of light. And their lifetimes are very long compared to the uh, ones produced in the lab that are not moving near the speed of light. And so we measure that one has a long time, uh, uh, you know, in our frame of reference, it appears to live for a long time as compared to a, a slow moving one. But in its own frame of reference, there's no difference. So it's a relativistic effect. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same answer. Can, can, just to, just, just um, on this question about um, why yeah. does the expansion of space cause time dilation? Are we sure that the expansion of space does cause time dilation, or is that? No, we're not sure. Okay. Right. We're not sure space even expands. Yeah. Because okay. you can't measure it. All right. So it's a it's just a <laughs> mathematical model to explain uh, yeah. an effect. There's no laboratory experiment you can do to measure expansion of space. No, no. I mean, people have proposed it, but actually, it, it's like trying to measure the ether. It's the Michelson Moly experiment. You know, the, the, the idea, it, the parallel is with a boat crossing a river. You know, if you, you sail your boat, the, the, a component of the motion of your boat is added to the motion of the river. Mm. And the idea was 100, what is it now, 20 years ago. Was the idea was that uh, light passing through vacuum, depending on the motion of the source, will pick up some speed from the motion of the source. So if you're flying, your torch is flying along and you're measuring it, you will get a oh, yeah. speed of light plus the speed of your torch yeah, relative to your observer. Well, this, you actually get that when you fly a plane, don't you? 
it, it takes longer to go to Melbourne than to come back from Melbourne. Yeah, but that's no, that's the that's lots of reasons. No, that's because, isn't that because you're flying in the same direction as the planet spinning on one direction? It is, yeah. but what happens is you, you get what's called a jet stream, and that's due to the bulk movement of the Earth because of the rotation of the Earth mm -hmm. or against. Yes, yes. But oh, it, yeah, you're, you're quite right in that sense. But of course, in the famous Michelson Moy experiment, this there was this positive this idea of the ether, some substance that spaces that the right. light propagates through, mm -hmm. and all the experiments showed that there is, it, it has no effect. And so, therefore, the uh, speed of light measured by any inertial observer, that means non-accelerating observer, mm -hmm. is always the same mm -hmm. speed. Doesn't okay. matter what happens. And because of that, though, you get time dilation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the weird thing, the spooky thing about the way God constructed the universe. Mm -hmm. so can you explain the time dilation because of, because of that? Yeah. So, in this sense, if the universe has been accelerated out really fast, mm -hmm. if you have a, a, a beam of light in causal contact, that means the light can travel to us, we can see it. Um, therefore, for it to get to us, during our time, that means the time on the other clocks must be much greater than the time here. Otherwise, there's not enough time for the light to travel at the speed of light, C, to get to. Okay. It's only because it's, it's travelled from us to the other point. No, from the other point to us. That's just, but if you expand it to 6,000 years out, yeah, for the billion years, yeah. then it will work. Yeah. What, what, what are you saying? Yeah. Yeah. So saying we, the reason we have to well, we have that problem is because we're saying the universe is only six thousand years old, so we have to have uh, this whatever it is increase. Oh, time time. Uh, but if we accepted the model that the universe is thirteen billion years old, yeah, then, you know, <coughs> then there's no need for time dilation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That can, that can I ask another Kevin question then? Yeah. Um. And actually, if okay, if you had a thirteen point five billion year old universe as currently believed in the standard model, then you have a, also a light travel time problem. Yes. What is that? I was just, just yeah. going to say, I thought from what you were saying, that the numbers are much, much bigger than 30 million years. Uh, no, to, to okay. the edge of the visible horizon. Okay. You're, you're talking about the size of the universe that you would calculate it to be now yes. due to the expansion. Yes. So you only see to 13.8 billion light years, but if you work out, because it's been expanding, how, how big it is, yeah. that means you get like, you know, 25 billion light years. So you get 50 billion across. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So there must be 50 billion. Because when the light left, in other yeah. words, that's the light you see. Yeah. But now that, that object's moved further yeah. up. Yeah. You know? So that's just a calculation. And that's a number you will commonly see, um, like 50 billion light years or something like that. What is the time problem in the 13 billion? Okay, so if you have a, the standard model, right, um, and your your universe is 13.8 billion years old based on Earth clocks, but the Earth clocks are the same as any uh, free floating clock in the universe, right? That's what you would make that assumption. So mm -hmm. this is a cosmological principle. Yeah. It's true for all observers anyway. Yeah. Um, we see light coming from space, right? We see cosmic microwave background radiation that they say comes from the large scattering surface of the Big Bang. That's a 380,000 years after the initial bang, whatever you want to call it, the initial beginning. Uh, the, the, the radiation separated from the plasma and then travels freely through space. Right? Okay, we are sitting here 13.8 billion years later, assume. Yeah, yeah, if we look over there, and we look over there, we look everywhere, the radiation is perfect black body temperature radiation, which means it's smooth, uniform, even temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin, 2.75 degrees <coughs> or something like that, right? Um, just from drinking a cup of coffee or something, you know thermodynamics, and you know that if you leave your cup of coffee sitting here, and, uh, yeah. and you didn't have it in a styrofoam cup, and you go, oh damn, I've got to drink it. A few minutes later, it's cold. Yeah. Well, the trouble is our universes are already equilibrated. It's at the same temperature. And oh, yet, yeah. the light from there is just arriving here now for the first time. There's been no opportunity for it to mix up, to equilibrate. 
So why is the universe at the same temperature? That's called the horizon problem. It's a high time problem. There's no time for it. And the solution is inflation. Inflation. Do you understand that too? A little bit? It, it's, just, it's just like you imagine something's at the same temperature, it's had to mix up to come to the same temperature. And that's saying the whole universe that we see is at the same temperature. But is it, but is it increasing and decreasing, or what? The temperature. We're only measuring it now. What ah, is so now, going to be see, this is the problem. Yeah. You're talking about can you measure time dependence of some universal parameter? Mm. And this is this is now this issue about is what is the universe? Because the cosmologist says, of course you can. It's easy. Just look out there to redshift of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3. Every one of those redshifts is a different epoch of time. That's what he says. And so you could just measure it out of those different redshifts. You see what I'm saying? But what if that's not the case? Yeah, so they measure, they try to measure the temperatures of uh, cosmic radiation, microwave background radiation, on effects of, say, hydrogen clouds at certain redshifts. And they try to get a number for that temperature at that redshift. But that's a valid thing to try and do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. valid to try and do. Yeah. But of course it's got an underlying assumption or two, doesn't it? And the underlying assumption is that really representative of past history. Yeah, yeah that's very cool. Yeah. Which, which... Okay. Yeah, assumption. But that's so, the assumption yeah. 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 What's that? That's the assumption yeah. 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 yeah, which may not be the case then, of course. Yeah. 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 And of course, measuring the cosmic micro background temperature as a function of redshift does not give you the nice smooth trend as is, is reported in all the textbooks. I can show you lots of contradictions to that. Yes, yeah. although of course any textbook that's simplified enough for some undergrad student to understand is going to be a contradiction there. Well even in the same cloud sometimes they get remarkably different temperatures in the same cloud. Um, so, so this is another one of Kevin's questions and I think that it um, it could provoke just more of the same discussion that we've just had. Is, Johns, is your model just another model that explains observations reasonably well? Or is it a preferred model better than other reasonable models? <laughs> From I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say, number one, not my model, but Carmelli's model, it's his cosmology, right? Okay. I, I just adapted it with my. Um, Biblical boundary conditions. Okay, is Charmelli a, a creator? No, no, no. Okay. He was a big bang believer. Yeah. Right? But he but he was a Jew. No, Arp was a was a new age kind of believer. He was he actually he hated creation. It's interesting because we are authoring a paper together. Hey? Arp, me and Arp and, and, and my former student are all we're co-authors on the paper. <laughs> it's in submission now at right. Master of Physical Journal. Okay. And um, it's interesting that Arp knew that I was involved, and, uh, yeah. and he never liked creations. <laughs> we're working together, even after he dies. Yeah. So he's still an author on the paper. The yeah. editors allowed him to remain on, on as an author. So, um, uh, is Carmelli's what's his name? Model. Model. Yeah. Just another model that explains observations reasonably well, or is it a preferred model from a scientific? Well, from the explanation of data, I think it does a better job than a lot of the standard model does without so many um, added unknowns. Right? Yeah, this is where you brought down the fudge factor. Yeah. But then, but then... I read correctly, it doesn't eliminate dark matter, though, does it? The original model? This yeah. removes the need for it. There's no need for it at all. There's no dark matter in it. It eliminates the need for it. You don't need it anywhere. So when I was showing you mass and light, the, the calculations dynamic mass means in the Carmelli model that the mass you get is more consistent with the actual visible matter. You keep using the word more rather than consistent, so therefore I'm thinking there's, a, there's something going on. There. No, no, the ratios are in the right ballpark, two to five times the mass to light ratio. And the calculations all got numbers in that ratio for, for slightly better. I saw differences, I thought. Oh, you'd have to look at specific, you'd have to look at individual galaxies mm -hmm. and say how much light do we have and how much mass do we get exactly. Yeah. <coughs> I never looked at that. 
Yeah. But I fitted to the rotation curves. You saw the fits. Yeah. So if you fit, that means there's no dark matter. Josh? Yeah, uh, I've got a few points. Uh, you were saying that you're adding another dimension of coverage. Yeah, yes, yeah. In terms of dimension, you're talking about some kind of like orthogonal dimension, I think, because acceleration is, is directly uh, at the rate of change of velocity, the rate of change of yeah. uh, space, you know, yeah. like x, y, z. But this is so a different velocity. This is not the rate of change of the speed of particles through space time. Okay, so it's it not. So it's the rate of. It's, so it's not the rate, rate of change of space. No, it's the rate of change of expansion of the universe. Expansion in space. Yeah. Rate of change of expansion of the universe. Really, it's redshift. That's what it is. So, so you, you would consider it a, a, a different uh, dimension entirely to space. Oh. So it's, it's not just a derivation of, of space in, in terms of no, no, the acceleration no, 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 of space. No, it's an independent dimension. Yes. Okay. Okay. We have no trouble. Can, can you can you conceptualise what that is? I don't know. I can't. I know, but I mean, sure. I mean, that's what I'm asking. I'm wondering if you mean it as an orthogonal dimension. Yes, that's what it means, an orthogonal dimension. But I can't conceptualise what it means. I have a very big problem with that. What is an extra dimension of velocity of expansion of the universe? I can't. My well, that's brain. Very comforting for the rest of us. My, <laughs> my brain. I thought about that for many years. In fact, there's a guy at, at University of Adelaide. Um, James, James Chappell, uh, he's a sort of a theoretical physicist working in electrical engineering, but anyway, he's, um, <laughs> done some, he's done some very nice work on what's called geometric algebra, yeah. and he's showed that if you construct a universe with three space and three time dimensions, and these two um, um, space and time dimensions become like, they're like vectors, mm -hmm. they're vector properties, but there's an orthogonality condition that requires you to lose one of the time dimensions. This orthogonality condition cancels out one of the time dimensions, and you end up with three space, two time. Right? He showed, um, and this is something I've been trying to get him to sort of formalize, but he got to a sort of fairly toy model kind of state mm -hmm. where he showed that um, uh, this extra time dimension could be related to Carnelli's velocity condition, mm -hmm. which was a very interesting idea. So when I first came here, I wanted him to sort of develop that, and then he's gone off picking daisies and finding out Sinai or something and stuff like that, and I haven't got him to get into that any further. But the geometric algebra approach is a very, very interesting idea. To, 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 to think in terms of time is no longer a, a scalar dimension. Uh, so, yeah, second point. Uh, so you're talking about uh, some a shift in the laws of physics in terms of uh, going for cosmological scale. Yes. Do you think it's weak, a, weak accelerations? Yeah. yeah. So, do you consider it? Uh, so, you go from the quantum physics uh, at very small scales, where you've probably got uh, very high accelerations, for instance. Yeah. Uh, then you go into the Newtonian uh, yeah. physics. Do you consider that it's more than likely that it's been shifted onto another entirely different degree of physics? It could be. That, that's what that's what I found interesting. That it was like new physics on a new scale. Because I mean, quantum physics would have been hard for some people to swallow because yeah. it does huh? discard a lot of what we know. Yeah. Uh, and so, what people would say that what your idea is crazy. You say, well, people thought the same thing about quantum. Physics. They did. It's fun to lift up the crazy thoughts, isn't it? In fact, uh, no one believed Einstein for a good twenty years. Mm -hmm. Even even like a teammate child. <laughs> Uh, and, and the whole debate about quantum <coughs> physics, Heisenberg, and Schrodinger, um, those debates went on for a good 30, 40 years. Um, yeah, but um, uh, Carmelli's stuff is ignored. It, it's, it's not really going anywhere. There's a couple of people that do some work, <coughs> but um, it, it's largely ignored. Yeah. Um, I, I think if, uh, for example, if James Chappell could make a breakthrough on this extra time dimension idea, because um, extra time dimensions are not something that is 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 like um, ignored. There are people who, who do research in this. Um, so it's putting fire in place to get the two D plane as opposed to the yeah yeah that's right. So it'd be, it, it starts to have um, sort of 
you look, you look, you start looking at things in terms of um, uh, instead of all scalar quantities, you look at them in terms of vectors and intensities. You know, that it's like geometry now. It becomes like geometry. Um, there's a guy called Isaac Barr who has published a lot of papers in the, uh, in the uh, American Physical Society journals, like reviews of um, um, physical review letters and so on. And he has uh, four space and two time. He's got a six dimension. Just as we start to talk about um, various other dimensions, yep. um, it does sort of bring us to another one of Kevin's questions. Okay, right? sure. Stephen it's not stretched out. <laughs> 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 it was just a theory of <laughs> ideas. It's a good one, I like that. I know he's there because I've met him. He's very heavy, by the way. If God stretched out to heaven, then what is the boundary between miracles and the laws of physics? That's uh, uh, not sure if I can interpret the question correctly. Um, if I can interpret it this way, uh, the universe began. God, there was an origin, right? God, yeah. There was a creation. At some point, the laws of physics had to be created. At some point, the universe had to be created. The matter and energy content, the substrate, and whatever you want to call it, mm. had to be created. And that itself was a miracle. And that itself is a miracle. After that, I believe God allows things, generally speaking, to, to follow His created laws. Of course, miracles do occur. Miracles occur, and they're a violation of the standard laws of physics. You know, turning water to wine, for example, that was a violation, right? That reversed some physical principle. The burning bush. Reverse entropy, yeah. it wouldn't burn away, right? Mm -hmm. Shoes that didn't wear out for 40 years, I would really like to get. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we understand those were, were especially miraculous. Okay, I think you may have answered another one of these questions, yeah. but I'll just air it anyway, because yeah. he <coughs> said to make sure that it is. Yeah. Um, is it reasonable to resort to unverified miracles from a scientific perspective? How can we do science under those conditions as the ground can change from underneath our feet? Yeah. Um, I wrote an article on this that um, I called, um, got the name, but it, it, I, I, I read an article by um, a creationist who was talking about um, God sort of creating the universe the way it is, and you know, we see a very big universe and we really can't know how life even gets here from distant cosmos and God just does it by a miracle and, and, and that's it, you know. I read this article and I thought, that, that's not how God created the universe. And he made it so it's understandable. Um, yeah, there are miracles there, but the laws of physics are still <coughs> constant, they're trustworthy, and we can investigate. Maybe we won't ever learn everything, we never will, but we, you know, he's giving us the opportunity and the brains and the, the inquisitiveness and the mind to make those investigations. And I don't think that the best solution is, well, if we don't understand it, we just say it was by some miracle. Uh, so you're actually saying no there. I don't think that. That it's just resorting, oh, it was a miracle, it's not yeah. a good science, it's not a I think we should take natural law or natural physics as far as we can. Yeah. But of course, when we get into creation, we have to realise God was created. And, um, you know, otherwise, we're becoming it's just... It's during creation, week, was he using the natural laws and just speeding them up? Or was he just abusing those laws and just... Well, up to a point, I think, I think there's two cases. Some things God has to... Be at one point, he has to create the laws. He's got to create energy, and he's going to do it out of nothing. This is truly nothing. Um, so that's in violation of those laws, right? Yeah. But after that, I think God, his nature is to use things as he's set them out to be, you know, as much as possible. Um, it's only, uh, only on these special circumstances he violates those, those rules. And, um, if, if you look at, for example, Islam, they believe their Allah is not my creator God, it's a different guy. I'll be 
to it. Not that we're going to get into that debate tonight, no, guys. No, but no, for, no, another, no. for another night. But <laughs> their perception of Allah is his capricious. So the laws of physics or the laws of nature from one day to the next are not necessarily constant. Mm. That Allah can change them. And I believe that if you look at history and the so-called um, Islamic um, period of discovery and so on and so forth, you'll find that's why it's largely retarded, because they never believed that they were trustworthy laws. Whereas the Christians who, who were involved in science always believed that, that God was a trustworthy creator and, and that the laws of physics, and I would say physics, but all of the laws of nature, chemistry and everything. Uh, but just and during and creation and week, how do we see it? Uh, how would you see it as a I see a pushback as far as you can using what we know. And of course you must get to a point where where matter comes into existence and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And also scripture. We have to follow scripture. Yeah. It's gotta it's gotta be in line with what scripture says. You talk about this trustworthy God, you know. I'm fascinated when I think about the mind of Einstein and the discovery of relativity. Yeah. That Einstein was driven by that. He wanted the laws of physics to be the same to any observer. And when he understood from different relativity positions, yeah. he realised that our common knowledge of time and distance and mass were not what they used to be. They had to be variable. We have to have shrinkage of distance and no, time. Yeah, but you're focusing on the wrong thing. Relativity is a law of... Um, um, not change, but a law of constancy. Exactly. It, it, the laws of physics are constant. Right? Yeah, that's what Einstein said. Yeah, and that's it's, it's actually misnamed. It's a law of constancy, not of relativity. I like that. That's the theory where because you can write down something where the physics is uh, independent of the observer. Any observer would derive the same physics. Exactly. And that makes sense. That's a logical. Yeah. Not one with a different guy can work out different physics from another guy. Well, I'm just commenting here that you just underline the idea that God created the law and it stays that way. Yeah. Einstein sort of took it a bit further than most other human beings and said, under different conditions and different philosophies and different considerations and so on, different people will still say the law is constant and nobody else had said that before and thought about what it meant. Yeah. Basic Christian concept that he took to discover relativity. So, um, the question is, can you just apply it to understand the miracles? Because then you can't use the constancy. No, 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 no. That's right. Yeah. That's where it breaks down. It does. Yeah. Mm. Mark. Mark. Um, from the point of view of bias, I was just wondering about your faith journey and at what point in time you had to believe and whether you've been seriously challenged in your beliefs by anything that you've discovered in your research and thinking uh, 40 years ago I came to know the Lord. How old were you then? Uh, I was, I was <sighs> I think 70. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 so I was 20. 20. So you just yeah. finished just finished the science degree. Oh. You just finished your science degree. I, I see no, I was, I was um, so I was in my what third year, third year of undergraduate in physics. Okay, and was it a blind revelation, or was it like Pretty much. All, all, all the facts seemed to gel to something? Yeah. No, it was like going down in a very dark place for me. Where God pulled me out of it, mm -hmm. but it was a revelation. Yeah, there was no preaching. And how, how do you deal with people who say, "Oh, you're biased"? You know, you've got an of course, of course, I'm biased. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I just say, I disagree. Just, they have as well. They have as well. I just say that I'm biased and they're biased, we have different biases, that's right. Everyone has, it's world views. This is the whole thing, you know. We all have a world view. Yeah. Everyone has to. You seem to be quite mathematical in some of the proofs that you were in. Oh, I love mathematics. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> you can do any way in mathematics, even stuff that doesn't belong in this universe. <laughs> <laughs> like imaginary numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the yes, the minus two no. <laughs> Before you learn it, does God know all mathematics? Or can you invent new mathematics that God and Dad thought of? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, 
This is sort of almost uh, leaving the field of science. But so actually, I won't ask it yet because you were halfway through asking a question. Well, I think I just asked the question. So can you restate it because I did interrupt you, and I'm sorry. Sure. It's about constancies across laws being complete, and it's on the, the obvious point that this is skirting around, which is like, but we can't rely on them. We can't do it. And saying yes, but then that actually, what are the implications of that? It means that they're not constant. We can't rely on them. We can't just investigate the world at that point. Because it, you know, if it breaks down at that point, then you can't rely on it with certainty anywhere. But some, but some people argue that that's mystic. It's a mystic thing. Christian saying it says that when we in the realm of miracles, you're talking about God or someone that God has empowered, you are talking about someone who has can be trusted, usually. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, and do you ever Peter, do you ever think about sitting on a chair before you sit on the chair? Uh -huh. Do you ever do that? I don't know what you're going with that, but uh, you never think about it, do you? Because there's more space between your atoms than actually the atoms occupy. So why would you actually trust the chair? And the reason is, is because you've done the experience. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the answer to it. Because the things that we rely on are things that we've gained. So it's a kind of faith. And that faith is accumulated through experience. So it's not faith in the laws themselves, or the no, it is. Old, it is. It's or just the universe is built this way no, because it can be broken. It is faith in those laws. It's just that we don't necessarily interpret them at that level. Sitting on the chair, you don't do a calculation of the binding energy of the atoms. You don't. You just. It's just based on experience. But what you're saying is that that faith is this. Is actually this place because one, if it's if miracles are possible, then one day God might be in the chair. And that one, that yeah, well, that comes down to what so kind of God have you got? Because my God doesn't destroy that. the possibility of that faith. It's actually, you're really trying to hand your cake and eat it too by saying these laws are wonderful and these laws are the basis of science. But, but Peter, at any time, but Peter, I am saying, on. I agree, I am saying you can have your cake and eat it too. Hedley, I am saying that. But Hedley, the chair will, contradiction. will break under Maybe you, so that, that there. And um but, and, but yeah, okay, so yeah. And yeah, so the yeah, Hedley the chair will break, but but nearly every case it won't. Yeah. And um and So we can rely on God not doing miracles very often, is what you Correct. Saying. We can rely yeah. on God not pulling the chair up and talk like he does every five seconds, but I think you I think what you said is true. We can rely on God not doing miracles very often. And when he does them, it's usually because he's really trying to get someone's attention. Yeah. It's got good reason to change the laws to do a miracle for the good, uh, good and not for harm, and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, but, I mean, you're assuming that God is breaking the laws of physics by performing a miracle. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so this is a question. Yeah. With yeah. God, you know, He can actually come into the physical realm and actually apply forces. And what not for what he had to. I mean, for instance, I suppose uh, when the sun was stood still in the mm. sky, for instance, you say that's a, that's a miracle and it breaks all the laws of physics that we, we know, but you're assuming that God hasn't actually messed with the mechanism, got in there with a screwdriver and actually physically made a change to these systems that actually uh, you know, there is an actual physical explanation for it, uh, which isn't necessarily breaking the laws. He's actually had some kind of intervention. He's down or he, he intervened in some way, still consistent with the laws. I mean, so like the turning, laws. turning water into yeah. wine, I mean, that's just speeding up the process. I mean, water, you know, adds nutrients to water. Yeah, and you've got wine. Miracles in physical terms, and if you, if you look at probability and, and they've got far around probability, then of course you're not actually breaking the laws, it's just very probable. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, um, one of my concerns has been that there's this assumption that when we come up with the laws of, the laws of physics or a law of anything, uh, that in some way God has to fit into that. And um, Peter got all that in mind. All we're doing is we're discovering parts of what he's done that are predictable. And because by, well, not by what we're going to talk about tonight, but normally um, experimentally being able to prove that if you keep doing this, you get that result. Um, well, that's right. That's in our experience. Right? Yes. We we perform 
what I would call operational science. Mm. We do it constantly, all the time. If yeah. you keep doing what you've always done, yeah. if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I find that a lot of people will just assume that because it looks like a chair, you sit on it, where I'm not that fussing these days. So <laughs> I look at the chair and say, it's got a broken wheel on it, or, you know, some, some reason why I might behave the way I expect it to behave. Yeah. But that's not because of the breakdown in space no. of God so much as you break down in space of chair makers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, it's it's a different issue. Yeah, humans, yeah, very <laughs> Yeah, it's a different <laughs> issue. It's so it's really. no, but just as I, but I think the idea I'm trying to get across is, is and I, I really welcome your comment on this, this idea that men can come up with laws and that God has somehow to fit into them. Do you, do you know what I'm getting at? But that uh, we want God to be predictable. And I heard a bit earlier that the idea that it's a Christian idea of the laws of physics. Well, it depends which Christian you are, because I don't think uh, Jonathan Edwards would agree. Um, really? Well, I don't understand I so. it that way at all. You know, I don't know. Because God's the creator, he can do what he wants. Yeah. It's his universe. He can be capricious if he wants to. He can do whatever he wants. He just isn't, but it's not his nature. But, but um, the, the, the example of the, the, the earth stopping, so, or the sun stopping, so, so, so. that's a good one, because if, if, if that stopped, that's a perturbation of something. Per- 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 that could then cause the whole of the universe to collapse because what, what are the rest of the things doing at the same time? Mm. Mm. And they're being held there because that guy's going to move over there and they're going to move to follow him. Yeah. But if you stop it, what are they going to do? So you're changing history by if you, by doing that. Yes, and that's the problem we've got is that it's trying to explain it physically. But, yeah. You know, um, that perturbation has huge implications. Yes. I was, I was if you follow the physical laws, they haven't changed. I was a taxi driver 10 years and it always used to intrigue me that even microseconds of difference could alter, completely alter the course of events here in the moment. And, mm. um, and I think about God that way. In fact, I can consciously remember, for those that aren't believers, bear with me, but I can consciously remember the sense sometimes that I was being led into a trap, a safe, one of Satan's traps, and actually making a conscious decision that I wasn't going to go there, I would go there just to, to break this, what felt like I was having an, an accident or something like that. Mm. And, and you know, people who don't believe might understand that, but it was very real at the time. Oh, yeah. And I have no way of proving it because yeah. well, it didn't happen. Things didn't happen. Yeah, so taking things in a slightly different direction, and this was one of my own <coughs> questions, yeah. um, uh, if that's okay. So, not so much about the maths now, but more about the theology. Um, the, and it goes to the, the genre of, of the creation narrative. Okay, so you can guess the realm of questions it's going to be, right? You, you talk, the science is fitting into a particular biblical worldview. It's a biblical worldview, but there are other biblical worldviews, you know? And, and they, um, they, they would look at, okay, um, uh, ancient Near East um, mythology, and I don't use that word to say not true, yeah. okay? Um, had, a, had, a, had a style of talking about origins. And um, and uh, Genesis one to three um, doesn't completely follow that genre, but it's not totally removed from it either. In the same way that Revelation is apocalyptic writing, right? Um, but it's obviously it's in different it's in a different category to us as believers than other apocalyptic writing. Yeah. So so those first um, chapters of Genesis are uh, in a ancient Near East mythological genre. Obviously they are true, they're, more, they're in a different way to other writings that are similar, in the same way that Revelation is true, in a different way to other apocalyptic writings, right? So, um, yeah, so uh, well, what is my, my question is, my question is, um, with, um, I mean, does, does your model um, um, demand uh, that interpretation, like that, 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 that literal, you know, earth clock view of those days um, as, as the way you interpret, the, you know, that, that whole narrative? And, and if so, then there, there are all, because if, if you're going to interpret them that, in those ways, there are some other problems, you know, like, um, you know, in one one account, um, uh, people are made after the plants and stuff, 
and another count, Adam's made before the plants and stuff, yeah. and so on. In non non biblical writings, you mean? No, I'm talking no, about no, Genesis, chapter one Genesis and, two. and chapter two of Genesis. Genesis chapter two, people are made after plants. Yes. Is that what you're saying? No, before. Before. In Genesis chapter two. In Genesis people. chapter two, people are made before the plants. Well, get out a Bible. Then I've got one. <laughs> so, so basically, my my which one? Which one? Well, the narrow scene. Yeah. Not literally. This is a story thing. So, yeah. 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 That the, the, the model we've been talking about, from a scientific point of view, it all sounds good to me, right? Okay, it is based on six. Yeah, that's right. It's based on well, it's based on six days. Day four is when all this stuff happened, right? But I'm saying, what if what if Genesis one and two and three, but particularly Genesis one and two, for what we're talking about here. Are not meant to be taken in that kind of linear time, okay, you know, so in that genre of, of literature. Okay, so you're reading in the first, you're reading in the first verses of chapter two. You're reading uh, a time sequence into that. Are you? That's what you're saying. Yeah, because it says it says this and then this and 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 there was no plants because there was no man to till the ground and all of that. I mean. I don't take that. I don't take that as needing to be, you know, rigidly literal in that sense. Only, but that's only because I don't take the chapter before it to be needing to be rigidly literal. You know? No, I think I think that. So if you're going to read a time sequence into this, you're then saying the plants are made before man. But there's no there's no statement of of a time sequence here. Yeah, there's no statement. Oh. It's not. Oh. But in chapter one, there is.